Here's Benny. Here's my boy. Welcome back. I've been away for quite a while, and I'm sure some of you are wondering if I'm still all right, or maybe even still around. Well, actually, the fact of the matter is I've been very busy. Uh, I just got done installing a uh, about almost 600 square feet of uh, hardwood flooring and uh, finishing it. I, I install raw flooring, unfinished flooring. I don't put in uh, uh, pre-finished stuff. I just like to have it all integrated and it looks nice. And uh, before that, and actually it's still continuing, I cleared a substantial section of woods in my back uh, yard and uh, planted a garden. So, you know, excavating that out and getting that all cleared up and uh, getting ready for the planting and everything. I, I was about three and a half weeks late getting plantings in, but everything's turning out good right now. I've got, uh, I've got corn coming in fast and furious. Uh, tomatoes probably I'll have, uh, I'll be canning probably a, a couple of hundred pounds of tomatoes before I'm done. And uh, potatoes, I have five rows of potatoes and it goes on and on. Beets, you name it. Uh, winter squash is uh, developing really good and uh, we've had more summer squash and zucchini than we know what to do with. So that's what's been keeping me, me busy and keeping me away from the uh, gun videos but you know this is the time of year we're about getting ready to uh, get into the deer season, the hunting season, wherever you might be and um, you know invariably when I uh, go to the range to uh, check out my guns I'll run across somebody, almost always, I'll run across somebody who has some frustrations getting their gun sighted in. And, you know, I, I might, you know, kind of gently poke my nose in and uh, offer assistance. And sometimes it goes like this. I say, is this, a, is this something I can perhaps help you with? And this is maybe after I've watched the individual, you know, visibly frustrated going through maybe 15 or 20 rounds and, uh, you know, throwing his hat down on the bench and things like that. And so usually they'll say something like, yeah, I just want to get this on the paper, you know. So it goes from there. Well, I want to offer my uh, simple uh, suggestions on how to get a rifle sighted in very, very quickly. And this is not a matter of how to sight in. This is, a, this is the whole process. Uh, there, there are numerous videos out there about the different ways of actually sighting in a rifle and getting your scope sighted in, but that's not what this is about. It's, it's more all-encompassing than that. And the mistakes that I see lead to a lot of frustrations and uh, can lead to, lead to actual errors uh, when you're afield. You know, you can get your rifle sighted in that looks that it looks pretty good on the bench, but then you take it out in the field and uh, bullets are hitting far from where you actually thought they should be hitting, uh, simply because you do certain things wrong or are not aware that you did uh, certain things wrong. Nobody wants to do it wrong. Now, I will very frequently read online, you know, well, the rifle shoots more accurately than I can. I'm kind of, you know, I... That to me, that's that's an argument for uh, mediocrity. Uh, I like to always. I insisted with my students, uh, whether I was uh, shooting, uh, whether I was teaching my uh, police recruits how to shoot, or uh, whatever I, my my sniper team or whatever. I always insisted on doing better than they thought they could do, and and usually they could uh, they could do an awful lot better than they presumed that they could just simply by knowing the rules and knowing under, and understanding uh, the very basics. Now, I've seen all methods of people trying to sight in. Uh, I've seen people try to just actually stand on their hind legs and uh, shoot offhand at bottles and see where the bullets hit. And I suppose that might be all right if you're going to be uh, standing on your hind legs and shooting at bottles and you don't really intend to hit anything, but that's really not sighting in a gun and you really don't know where the rifle's hitting and where you're missing. Sometimes you're, what you think are your hits or your misses and vice versa. In order to really sight in a rifle, understand that there's a, there's a, you have to have a reference point. And that's what the whole sighting in process is about. It's not about testing you, and it's not about testing your ammunition, although both should, both should be good. And it's not about uh, testing your rifle. It's a, it's a matter of taking the three and getting them all to work together. So uh, in, in bench rest shooting for sighting in, we're not talking about how to bench rest uh, shoot for 
precision accuracy. We're talking about how to bench rest your rifle so that you know where it's shooting and to be able to zero it in for uh, the desired range that you wish to shoot at, for the trajectory that you wish to have. Now I did a previous video on this a few years ago and uh, you can refer back to that for a little bit, uh, a little bit of detail too. But uh, let's just suffice to say that it's important to always have a solid reference point. Get your rifle to shoot exactly where you want it to shoot. Coordinating your, your, your sights, whether it be telescopic sights or iron sights or red dot, whatever you have, make sure that that's first of all coordinated with your rifle in the way that you want to have your trajectory match up with your uh, game uh, distance. So. I'm going to presume now that uh, the average the average person is going to be shooting somewhere around uh, 250 to 300 yards tops. You know, some people might be shooting farther, but uh, it's, this this will work for the the great majority of uh, modern rifles, whether it be a 6.5 Creedmoor, uh, whether it be a 306 or 308. Uh, you know, uh, no matter what it is, you know, 243. Uh, this will generally work uh, very well. Now I've got a target set up there at 100 yards, and uh, right now the, I, I've watched in the last 10 or 15 minutes or so, the wind has really settled down. I was getting a very uh, strong wind. It was coming from 9 to 3, uh, from my back in other words. And let me speak a little bit about wind. It's greatly, uh, it's greatly underestimated, uh, its, its effect on a bullet. Uh, a bullet actually rides in the air, just like you drive down the road in a car, and you'll notice that the wind, if, if you get a strong wind, it'll tend to push the vehicle to one side and you have to fight it back into the lane. Well, that's what it does with a bullet, but there's nothing to fight it back. It can't steer, so it's, it's drifting off course along with the wind, whichever way the wind current carries it. So in effect, the, the bullet is actually riding along a current of wind, just like a, just like a leaf will ride down a current uh, in a stream. It's no different than that. So, you know, uh, a, a, a wind uh, varying with its velocity will carry a bullet in those directions. So I'm not going to, you can, you can check out all your trajectory tables and your, your charts, and they will tell you exactly what the wind value is for your particular uh, rifle, for your, for your cartridge, for your bullet, the uh, ballistic coefficient that you have, and all those variables. So I'm not going to get into that, but that's where you want to check it out. You want to check and just see what your various wind values do. But we'll presume right off the bat that unless you have a ferocious wind, anything within two to three hundred yards on big game, you know, something the size of deer and larger, is going to have minimal effect. Unless you're getting into winds which are, you know, in, in, in excess of 15 to 20 miles an hour, which is, you know, early in the morning, late afternoon when, when deer are most prevalent. Uh, you know, when you're more likely to see them when they're out, uh, they're probably, you, you're probably going to be dealing with milder winds. But let's talk about how wind affects a bullet by its direction. Now, a wind which is traveling from 6 to 12 or 12 to 6, in other words, down your bore, uh, whether it's a, toward the target or uh, from the target, that's called a uh, zero value wind. Uh, there's no value to that wind whatsoever on a bullet. Now there may be on extreme ranges, you know, the bullet can have different uh, uh, vertical trajectory at extreme range, but we're not talking about extreme ranges here in, in shooting, you know, a half and three quarters or a mile. We're talking within reasonable ranges uh, up to even in 600 meters or so, 600 yards. Uh, right now I've got a wind that appears to be I just lost my glasses. I've got a wind right now that it's probably about a 12 or 15 mile an hour wind, and judging by the grass, is blowing from about 10 o'clock to uh, 4 o'clock or so. Now, that would be called that would be called a half value wind. So, in other words, if the wind is blowing at say 14 miles an hour, a half value wind is actually thrusting that carrying that bullet at seven miles per hour because it's not fully impacting the bullet on its side, either side left or right. A full value wind is either from three to nine or nine to three. 
So shooting into or away from the wind, directly into or away from the wind, is a zero value wind. Shooting uh, with a wind that's directly from your back, in other words, hitting the rifle perpendicular, uh, that is a full value wind. So a wind at, at, at 10 miles an hour, you're getting a full value of 10 miles per hour. But if it's quartering, if it's coming from, if it's coming obliquely from your, from your side or from your back, that would be a half value wind. And you know the fractions go on from there. So there is a there is a slight there is a slight value to the wind if it's coming from one o'clock or eleven o'clock or if it's going in that direction. Uh, but it again those that's how wind affects it. So sometimes even on a even on a very strong windy day, if the wind is directly from your back shooting you know down the bore, or if it's shooting from the target, uh, that that will have uh, very minimal if if. Uh, if any effect at all. But if it's pouring in from your side or directly from uh, your face, that, that it not only will have an effect on the bullet, but it also has an effect on you as a shooter because if you happen to be standing out uh, into that wind, uh, there's, you know, there's wind currents that are hitting your body as well. We'll talk about those things at a later time. What I want you to do is understand that setting up on a bench rest does not require to have, you know, a sophisticated bench rest such as this. This one here happens to be a, a nice, uh, a nice bench rest setup, and uh, it's it's a Rock BR. Uh, it's uh, called well, very nice, very nice uh, setup. It has uh, adjustment for I can turn I can turn the the windage here. Uh, I can I can turn the windage knobs left and right. I can adjust the uh, sandbag pressure on the uh, on the fore end. Uh, it's got a it's got a fore end stop right here, which is nice because it, it's really it's not to push it against. It's just a reference point. So you know you can visibly just check and make sure that your rifle has returned back to that shooting position from one shot to the next. I've got a really nice uh, I've got a really nice uh, protect uh, protector. Uh, Sandbag here. This is a high. This is a high sandbag with, with high, uh, rabbit ears, and it's got a. Uh, it's got a very, heavy, uh, solid leather base, uh, firm solid leather base. I like that. Um, you know, you can get away with a lot of fore end rest. The fore end rest can be as simple as a, a rolled up uh, pair of jeans tied with a string. Uh, it can be a you know it can be a blanket that's rolled up or whatever it is. It should be somewhat it should be somewhat uh, somewhat soft and yet and yet uh, not overly. You don't want to have a cushy. Uh, it sh it should be soft but uh, firm. Uh, think of a think of a very firm mattress that sort of thing. Uh, it, ideally, it can be a, a sandbag which gives it a good a good padded. Uh, but firm surface that will always return back to uh, where you were the previous shots. Ideally, it should have some sort of uh, way to anchor it into your bench. This has some pointed. This has some pointed uh, toes on it here, so that I can I can bang it into my bench and it won't it won't skid around. But even if you don't have that, even if you have a uh, just a rudimentary f uh, front rest. Just make sure it's not a two by four wrapped with a you know with a piece of carpeting or something like that. I see I see that oftentimes at ranges. You know they'll leave those around for the guys to sight in their guns. And really, there's nothing worse than having a, a rifle banging off of a hard surface. You don't want to have that. You want to have something that's uh, soft and resilient. Something that uh, and also too. It's it's a good thing if the if the rest has a little bit of. Uh, slip to it if the ri if the rifle can uh, slide back and forth. Now I actually I actually talcum powder this uh, every now and then just to give it a little bit more slide. And but more important than the front rest, I think, is the rear rest. The the rabbit ears on the back. I think if you're going to invest in anything, invest in some good rabbit ears. Uh, and the rabbit ears are good because they you adjust your you control your your fine elevation by simply squeezing. Uh, these these rabbit ears, and the method of the method of taking up a, a shooting position. Let me turn my hat around here, so I'm not getting in the way. Uh, the the method of taking up a position is to make sure your feet are square and planted flat on the ground. 
you don't want to have them underneath you and you don't want to have them stretched out. You want to have your feet as if you're sitting in a chair at a tension. You want to get a good, get a good height so that, right now I'm sitting on a, a folding stool, but you want to get a good height so that uh, you're, not, you're not leaning over your rifle and you're not reaching up. Whatever you have to do to get the rifle so that when, you, when you're shooting, your, your, head should, your head should be erect and it should be able to fall right in line with the, right in line with the uh, crosshairs. And it should have some sort of a height adjustment, uh, something that you can, that's what I like about this. I can, I can adjust the height on this and I can get my sandbag lined up and right now I, I can I can shoot like this all day long as solid as can be. I'm going to raise this up just a tiny bit. There we go. So right now without even having to do anything I can get that I can get that rifle to uh, stay right dead on that target. I can adjust my windage and like I say, even if you don't have a sophisticated bench rest like this, these are not cheap. You know, this is probably about $160 or something. It's all ball bearing mechanism. Uh, it's really nice, and you can spend a lot more than that. You can you can spend as much as you want, or if you go to uh, you know Brownell Sinclair and stuff like that. But uh, you know, a good rest is always a good thing. But I really I really recommend that you have a good solid uh, sandbag and something that you can manipulate. Uh, at the very, very least, make sure you have something underneath there. Uh, you got to have you got to have something for that gun stock to rest against. Because if you don't have that, that you, all you're doing is just practicing with your own shooting technique, and you're, you're gaining nothing. Remember, you're trying to sight in your rifle. This is not this is not a competitive issue. This is not to see how well you can shoot. Bench rest shooting is not as easy as it uh, appears to be to uh, a lot of people. You know, the bench, the bench rest shooting fraternity knows that uh, there are many, many variables that come into play when you're shooting in bench rest. I just spoke of the wind. That's one of, that's one of several factors. The other huge factor is mirage. Now today it's a bright day. It's, uh, it's, it's, the air is crisp, very low humidity. Uh, you know, this is a, uh, this is a late summer uh, afternoon. And uh, so everything is very favorable right now. I don't have I don't have any mirage off the barrel right now at all. Um, sometimes the most the most severe mirage is when you're shooting in snow, uh, you know, over snow. Uh, when you're shooting uh, on a very cold day, a hot barrel can create a lot of mirage on a day like that. Uh, but you certainly get the supiest mirage when you're working with uh, hot, humid days and uh, especially as the distance becomes longer and your telescope becomes, your, your scope becomes more powerful because it compresses, it has an effect of compressing all that vapor and making it seem supier than it really is. So what you might not see with a uh, four power scope or a three power scope will come, really become thick and uh, like looking through a, a bucket of oily water uh, it, when, it's a, when it's a high powered scope. Right now, I've got this particular, this is my 222 Remington, and I said that correctly, it's a 222 Remington, uh, the 222 was a cartridge I covered some uh, years ago, it was invented by Mike Walker, and it was the predecessor to the 223 and the 222 Remington Magnum, which became, the, that case size became the 204 Ruger, uh, became the uh, basis for the uh, 221 Fireball, and it goes on and on. There's so many cartridges that uh, that, that that spawned, you know, wild wildcats. So even the uh, 300 blackout is uh, really is is the uh, one of the children of the uh, 222. The 222 started the whole thing out when Mike Walker invented it in 1950, and this was a this was a slam dunk. Uh, this was the bench rest cartridge of the day, and it remained that way well into the uh, 70s when uh, Ferris Pendel and, uh, and uh, Dr. Palmasano uh, invented the, uh, peep, the 22 and the 6 millimeter PPCs. So uh, the, uh, the cartridges, the cartridge is uh, very accurate. I know that it shoots very accurately. But what I want to tell you is uh, essentially how to get how to get set up. Now I've got to get my I've got to get my shooting glasses. I've got three rounds. Now the idea 
is to fire just three rounds. One of the frustrations I see so often is somebody will show up with a box of ammo or two boxes of ammo and they just they, they shoot one shot and then they make an adjustment and then they shoot another shot and they make another adjustment and it goes on and on like that until they fire 20 rounds off and they, they're not getting anywhere because the bullet's not going where they wanted. Uh, understand that unless you have a supremely accurate rifle uh, your, your bullets are not going to go in the same place each time. That's just that's just the way it is. Even with this rifle, uh, this is a this is a quarter MOA rifle. Let me speak of MOA for a minute. MOA means minute of angle. A minute of angle is sub tens. In other words, it's a it's an angle that goes out uh, infinitely, and it sub tens at a hundred yards to one inch. At two hundred yards, is two inches. So a MOA rifle at one thousand yards. That's ten times a hundred. A hundred uh, at, at a thousand yards, a MOA rifle, a one MOA rifle, is shooting a ten-inch group. That's how MOA is. I hate to see it when people say my gun shoots M. It shoots one MOA at fifty yards. If it shoots, if it shoots one inch at fifty yards, it's a two MOA rifle uh, because it's a fraction thereof. So. I'm going to get this thing loaded up, uh, grab my glasses, put my hearing protection on, and I'm just going to basically demonstrate the process of shooting. So let me do that. Okay, so as I said, one of the things that I see sometimes is people shooting, um, you know, uh, they, they fire one shot after another. You have to fire, uh, you, you should fire three shots. There's no, there's no need in firing any more than three unless you happen to know that you pulled one off the paper uh, unintentionally. But uh, the, the very first thing that you should do is understand that you need to, you need to get bore sighted. Um, from 25 yards, no greater than that, 25 yards, even 20 yards, uh, you want to take, you take your bolt out if you can do it and you want to look down through your look down through your your barrel and line up your have a bullseye a black bullseye look down the barrel right now i can see my i can see my target out there at 100 yards it's very sharp and clear right down the middle of my barrel and i want to look through the scope and i want to see roughly i want to be able to see that the crosshairs are pointing Toward that, toward that target at 25 yards. That's where you start out. Don't, don't bother wasting your, wait, wasting your money, wasting your time trying to get the first shot on the paper at 100 yards. You don't need to have, you don't need to have any special instruments to do this, and you certainly don't need to go out and spend money for a, uh, a, a laser uh, bore sighter or anything like that. This is a simple process. It's, it usually is done in a matter of one or two shots. You look down the bore. Get the paper lined up, then look down, and the very first thing you should do before you do anything else is, is optically center your, cro your crosshairs. That means taking both covers off, taking both scope caps off, turret caps, and wind it gently to a complete stop in either direction. Wind it to a complete stop, then count the exact number of revolutions. It's probably going to be somewhere around six or eight revolutions until it gets to the other stop. Then divide that by two and come back to the center. Do that with the elevation turret and do that with the windage turret and center your crosshairs optically. If you have a, if you have a rifle with decent uh, bases and uh, decent mounts and everything, uh, de decent rings, you're probably going to be at least on the paper at 20 yards. Once you, get, once you get on the paper at 20 yards, then you want to fire, just fire one shot and see approximately where it went. At 20 yards, you're not going to need to have a group. But on a large piece of paper, you want to have a, a good-sized piece of paper, a sight and target is ideal, that will catch that bullet. Please don't put up a small target or put up a bottle or something like that. From that point, make your, make your, ele your elevation and windage adjustments Always remembering that your your scope setting or your iron sight setting back at the receiver, back at this end, the rear sight, you move in the direction that you wish the bullet to move on paper. So if your bullet is shooting low, if your 
If your bullet is striking low, you want to raise your elevation by turning this up. And conversely, if it's shooting uh, to, the, to the left and you want to bring it right, bring your crosshair right. From 25 yards, everything you have to multiply by four. Then you simply bring the, the target out to 100 yards. You're probably going to be within three or four inches or less of the, of the bullseye at 100 yards. Then you repeat the process. So let me get my hearing protection on here. I've got three rounds of my uh, 222, and these are 50 grain Sierra Blitz Kings. Beautifully accurate bullet. Kind of expensive, but very, very accurate. Um, and it happens to be these, you notice that bolt went down very firm, and that's because these these cases are just, uh, they're just necked. Uh, they've been fired, oh, these, these cases have probably been fired uh, 10, or, 10 or 12 times at the very least. Uh, this is a, this is a, uh, a very accurate powder, it's a traditionally accurate powder with the 222. It's H322, Hodge and H322. Um, so let's see how this does. Remember, first of all, feet planted firmly on the ground. I want to get, I want to get my, both arms should be here. You don't want to have one hand out here. You certainly don't want to have the hand underneath here. That causes influence. You want to have it firmly on your rest. Get this hand cradled underneath your chest so that it can manipulate that bag and squeeze the bag into position. And with your feet firmly, squarely, I'm at about a 45 degree angle, so I'm very natural. The rifle stock is in my uh, shoulder here, and uh, that cross here is dead solid. Right now the wind has calmed, and so I'm just going to let it go. Uh, right now, according to my, uh, well, it's calm here. I'm seeing a uh, nine to three wind out toward the target. So that's, that tells you that, see, wind doesn't blow uh, en masse, it blows in currents. So you want to watch those variables all the way out to the target. Sometimes, you know, if you're, if you're shooting on a windy day, especially if you're in a grassy area, turn your power down so that you can watch the grass all the way out to the target. And you get an idea where the wind currents are. So you want to watch for all the grass to either settle down, or if you're, you know, if you're a bench rest shooter, you don't have the luxury of uh, waiting for things because you're getting a lot of time to fire. So people will sometimes pick a particular wind value and then they just pop off all their shots at one time while they they catch it. Uh, so that even though even though they're not hitting the bullseye, uh, their groups are all uh, becoming centered. Now I'm picking up that wind again. I'm feeling it from my back. All right, I'm going to let it rip. You know, I... Unfortunately, my other camera battery is uh, out of juice, so I, I was hoping I was hoping to be able to set it up so you could see these shots landing on paper. Uh, we'll have to just watch it later. It looks like I had a little bit of wind, right from where I said, a little bit from uh, nine to three. So it, it pushed it about three eighths of an inch, about a half inch maybe, to the uh, right. Two twenty-two. I, I just love this cartridge. It's, it was my first high-powered rifle cartridge. I had a uh, L four sixty-one Seiko Vixen rifle uh, back in the sixties, uh, and uh, it, it was such a superb shooter. Uh, that's where I got when I was uh, I was shooting my first uh, woodchucks with a high-powered rifle, and uh, man, oh man, out to 300, 350 yards. You know, it's, it's categorized as a 225-yard as a, uh, cartridge, but 
you know, it's so accurate, you can, you can lob them in there any distance you want. So here we go. Well, it looks like I got about a three-eighths of an inch group out there, from what I can tell. Um, and they're, they're landing at about a little bit out towards three o'clock, which is consistent with the wind. Uh, so after you've fired three shots, you might, you might have a rifle that shoots to, uh, you know, one and a half inch groups. Well, a, a two and a half inch group rifle is absolutely perfectly suited for uh, deer hunting or elk hunting or anything else because uh, you're, you're, you're refined on any size game uh, out, to, out to 300 yards or more. So when you have a, uh, when you have a three shot group on paper, what you want to do is take the center of that group it's the center of that group. Make a, make a dot on the paper if you want. If you can't figure out exactly where the center is, just measure over, up, and down, and see where it is. Put a, put a dot or, or imagine where you are. And then if you're using a sight-in target that has one-inch squares on it, just simply count how many squares over and down or up you need to go, and that will place you on target. I'm going to fire three more shots off. I'm going to go for uh, a different target on that paper. That's a... Uh, T standard sight in target so I can I can shoot uh, I can shoot uh, five different groups on that uh, same piece of paper without disturbing uh, the other groups um, I love this Seiko this one here this is a Seiko Tika this Tika T3 uh, I did this uh, I did a video some time a two-part video on uh, how to uh, glass bed, epoxy bed a rifle. And uh, this, this rifle really didn't benefit by it because Seiko did such a beautiful job bedding it from the factory, uh, just wood on metal. It, it's such a perfect uh, bedding job that it didn't really benefit by it that I could tell. Uh, it certainly didn't hurt it any, uh, but uh, this, this gun is a superb shooter. You can knock, I could knock woodchucks in the eye all day long with this, so uh, it's, a, it's a nice, nice gun. Um, no problem whatsoever with this uh, 14 power scope being able to uh, do a dental check and uh, put bullets exactly where I want. So here we go. I'm going to go to the top left target. A little wind activity out there. Nothing here. And it wandered exactly where that wind activity was. It's a little swift out there. I'm shooting into the side of a hill, and I think the wind is the wind is gathering against that hill like it would against a tall building. And I can see the I can see the vegetation on the side of that hill, uh, uh, kind of leaning heavily. So, uh, but that's all right. We're just still a very nice uh, still a very nice group. But I'm just going to keep on shooting. Remember to squeeze your shots off. Consistent cheek pressure also. Uh, you know, you want to be firm, get a good solid cheek weld, but maintain good consistent pressure. And I'm pushing that rifle back at the fore and back to where it was, so it settles back into place. Now I'm getting a strong uh, wind. The wind direction is changing back here. So it's, it's funny. The wind is coming right now. It's coming from my five o'clock, four to four or five o'clock is where it's coming from. But out there, it's moving from left to right. It's going from about uh, nine to three. So uh, that that bullet is probably doing a, a chicane on the way out there. Now the wind is coming over my left ear. It's moved from uh, 4 o'clock to... Uh, the wind is really uh, swift out there right now. I'm not correcting for the wind. If I was shooting bench rest, I'd be correcting for the wind right now. In fact, the, I'm watching the trees. There's maple trees and oak trees over there. And right now, they're, they're all silver colored. The leaves are turned over, so... There's a really strong wind picking up on this uh, hillside here. So we'll just see uh, 
I would say right now it's probably about an eight or two, eight or ten mile an hour wind gusting a little bit, maybe up to twelve, fifteen miles an hour. Everything about the everything about that target right now is telling me exactly what the wind is telling me. Uh, all the shots are falling. All the shots are falling uh, exactly. Uh, to the th toward three o'clock, which is where that wind is coming from out there. That's the predominant wind. Uh, we'll do it again. I can't. I can't forget that. I've got a nice. Uh, these are. These happen to be my old Winchester Western cases. WW. Uh, I've got some. I've got some beautiful Lapua cases too. But you know, uh, these are all. These are all turned. Neck turned. And uh, they all they all shoot very very well. Um, my lap work cases are more consistent in terms of weight, which means the volume. The more uh, they're more consistent in terms of volume, and that that makes a difference in the uh, group size. Um, I'm going to go for the left, the top right target now, and I'm not correcting for the wind, as I say. That struck the. Uh, that struck three o'clock. Right on the uh, small diamond. This trigger is a two and a quarter pound trigger. It's just nice and crisp. I think that bullet landed in the other hole. I'm not sure. That one might have suffered a little bit of velocity change. Might have been uh, that one struck down about a half inch beneath the uh, the others. See if I can find that case. Okay, so we're back in business. Uh, fire off the next three shots here. Um, but you know, I can't. Uh, I've had a lot of I've had a lot of very fine, accurate rifles and. Uh, several Seikos through the years. This is my first Tika. Um, this here shoots as accurately as any of the Seikos I've had. Uh, what makes the uh, Tika unique amongst the uh, Seiko family of rifles is that they use one receiver. Uh, by using one receiver they can use that use that basis for every caliber whether it's uh, whether it's 30 or 6 size cases down to uh, 222 in this case. Um, that's the owners of the property have, having a, they're out on their uh, Harley. So, um, the, um, the rifle, the, you know, the, the base, the base of the uh, rifle, uh, the cost is kept down by, uh, using one receiver, uh, and modifying the, uh, magazine for different lengths. You notice this magazine right here has got, it's, it's blocked in the back so that it handles these short uh, cases. So this will handle up to, say, the 223 size cases. Uh, and it will also handle, uh, by, by blocking it for medium size cases or 306 size cases, you can use the full length of the magazine. So it keeps the, it keeps the cost of production down, I suppose, and uh, keeps things simpler. Uh, you know, the, the wood is not all that exotic. It's a nice piece of walnut, uh, but it's, uh, it's fairly simple. The uh, checkering is uh, the checkering. I would say is some sort of a laser carved checkering or something. Uh, it's it's utility. Um, everything about it is a is a utility grade rifle, but it's a it's an extremely uh, accurate rifle. Uh, free floated. This has got um, fifty thousandths of an inch clearance all the way around the barrel. The same as um, in other words, I can put five business cards around that each each business each business card measuring ten thousandths of an inch. Uh, 
It's a very functional rifle. So for those who want to have Seiko accuracy and Seiko reliability, you can't you can't go much better than uh, this. Uh, I would say that it's not as fancy as my uh, it's not as fancy as my uh, Winchester Model 70 featherweights. I love those. Those are those are my favorite rifles of all, and uh, and I and I really uh, I, I really uh, can't say enough about free floating. Free floating and glass bedding, uh, they both go together. This system here uses a two-part, two-point two bedding system, the same that I use, uh, even from the factory. In other words, it's bedded at the two action screws. So let's fire off these last, some of these shots here and see what it does. Um, now I got no wind where I am. And the wind is pouring in from nine to three out there at the target along that hillside. And now the wind is coming from my back. And as you can see, this is, you don't want, if you're, if you're shooting in the field, you know, varmint shooting is one thing, that's no problem at all, but if I were going after coyotes or something like that where I wanted to have fast follow-up shots, I would not be, I would not be neck turning only, I mean neck sizing only. I'd want to have a fully resized case that slaps into place into that chamber very, very swiftly without any, without ha having to push that bolt down because the slightest bit of uh, dirt or something like that could impede my putting the bolt down and that could lose me a shot. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to worry about uh, the little gain in accuracy. What I'm talking about in accuracy gains here for doing uh, that sort of neck sizing is perhaps with a rifle like this is gaining me a quarter, a quarter to three-eighths of an inch uh, to my advantage. Uh, that, doesn't make a, that doesn't make a hoot of difference on game. So when you're out in the field, as I've mentioned before, when you're out in the field shooting, never just neck size only, always full length resize your cases uh, so you have maximum uh, utility so that they, so that they uh, chamber very, very easily. And you don't want to worry about, you don't want to wor worry about losing a shot on game. Okay, let's see. This is my lower right hand target. No, I'm still shooting that first, uh, Shot in the magazine. This is my second shot, so. The two twenty two was a murderous cartridge on. Uh, Varmints on woodchucks. Uh, it was a highly, highly respected cartridge back in its day. Very mild mannered. Uh, it's you can you can generally you know it targets it t distant targets out to 200 yards or more. Uh, you can see the bullets hit because it 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 doesn't it doesn't generate that much recoil that uh, moves your tar your target out of your crosshairs. So especially if you turn it down, you know my original Seiko Vixen uh, only shot at seven and a half power. It was a, it was a uh, M8, it was an M8 uh, scope, uh, loophole M8 that was made in the uh, late 60s, uh, mid to late 60s. And uh, so seven and a half power, uh, that's all I had. Well seven and a half power, I'm telling you what, I, I can shoot, I'm going to shoot, I'm going to shoot this next group of I'm going to shoot this next uh, group of shots with seven and a half power. It's not going to make a bit of difference because I can seven and a half power at 100 yards. Uh, I can see those crosshairs on the paper just as nice as could be. So it's going to be the lower right hand target. That's my favorite long-range uh, big game scope is seven and a half power, seven power, seven and a half power. 
eight power maybe. That's as much as you need for big game. Lightweight, compact, a lot more compact than this. With seven and a half power it, that that's set on right now, I can take you know the the small the small bullseyes on a um, sighting target. I can still put the crosshairs right in the middle of that diamond, like it's nothing to it. So uh, you lose nothing. Can you imagine on a, a an elk or a, or a uh, even a white-tailed deer at uh, 350 yards? Nothing to it. I mean, I I could. I can lay that cross here exactly where I want on his brisket. Oh, we're getting uh, dragonflies here by the, they're coming by the herd. I love that because uh, they eat up all the, they eat up all the uh, bugs that eat us. So I've got huge dragonflies. These are, I mean, they're like biplanes. They're gorgeous. Eating up all the black flies and mosquitoes that are hovering around here. They're doing a great job. Damselflies, too. I see those. Those are the small ones. Really nice. So that's it. So now what I'll do is I'll go take a look at those targets and we'll, we'll examine them together and uh, just see how they've done. Okay, there was group number one, group number two, or three, number four, number five. Now, as I say, these, these are Winchester Western cases. The volumes are uh, not consistent as they are with... Uh, my lap work cases, I wish I had had those loaded up for you. Uh, you can see the difference, but uh, even still, uh, that's a, uh, oh, half MOA rifle, even with that, uh, even with that ammunition. That group right there is uh, about three-eighths of an inch. So, as you can see, there's a consistency. I know that that rifle is sighted in dead on right now. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty stiff wind that I was shooting uh, without compensation, every one of them was being dragged over to the three o'clock position, and uh, the vertical dispersion is the volume of the cases. Uh, that's that's something to be expected when you have inexpensive cases. But that's the sighting process. Uh, now, I, it, with this one here, I would just simply know to sight that in if I had no wind, and ideally you want to sight in when you don't have a windy day. This would not be the ideal day to sight in. Uh, but I would simply bring my cross here over a half inch to the uh, right, I used to the left rather, bring the cross here over a half inch to the left, and if I wanted to shoot, uh, if I wanted to shoot buttons all day long at 100 yards, I'd be dead on. Now, I would normally uh, position my, I would normally, if I was sighting this in for woodchucks, I'd be uh, sighting this in so I was about two to two and a half inches high at 100 yards and that would place me way out at uh, 250 yards or more meaning that I'd be able to strike anything from here to here within uh, about 275 uh, yards so that would give me a full that would give me full uh, dead on uh, what you call point blank trajectory so that's it thanks for watching don't forget to subscribe and God bless is there he is, coming like crazy. <laughs> You're having a great time out here, aren't you? Yeah, he loves running around in this meadow here. And uh, he's pretty, he's pretty swift. He knows, uh, he knows to stay away from certain things. He got zapped once a uh, long time ago by a skunk, so he's, he knows what they're all about. He's not going to get, he's not going to get into that mistake more than once. And. Uh, 
he's uh, he's come across a couple of porcupines. Uh, he usually barks at them. Gets he gets all lathered up and barks at them, but uh, he doesn't. He seems to know that they're not something to tangle with.